Hi and welcome to Make or Repair. I'm finally getting back to doing some test gear repairs and I'm going to tackle this 100 megahertz four channel scope. Now despite being analog this is a pretty nice scope with digital readouts, time and voltage cursors and measurements and some interesting dual triggering and time based controls so it's well worth the effort. I got this scope up and running some time ago but it's been sitting on the shelf waiting for me to tackle a major problem. It doesn't have anything like the advertised 100 megahertz bandwidth and unfortunately manuals and circuit diagrams are hard to come by. There are some other tasks to complete with it like perhaps replacing capacitors, certainly cleaning switches and things like that but I think if I can get the bandwidth sorted I'll probably just sell this on for some enthusiasts to deal with those issues. Anyway let's get started. And as we can see it's got some digital readouts so we've got a delay uh, delta t and we've got a time per centimeter readout here as well and we're looking pretty good i'm going to be honest and we'll just yeah he moves up and down quite freely so that's good let's try channel three also happy and good let's try channel two uh hang on a minute i need to Change the source, there we go. Here's channel two, moving up and down very happily. Which is zero him, so it doesn't get in our way. There's channel one, again, moving up and down very happily. So all these channels appear to be working, so this is a really good bit of news. So let's put it on channel one only, just so we've got no interference from anything. And I'll move channel one up to the center. There we go, looking good, and we shall turn on. Okay, so uh, that's one. Let me put this on 0 0.5. So it should be spanning about two. Uh, and I need to change my time base, which is somewhere. Here we go. So this is our time base and it's reading it out here time per centimeter. I'm not triggering at the moment. Trigger on channel one, this is B trigger, A trigger. Uh, Channel three, uh, channel one. There we go. It's amplitude. Let's measure its amplitude. So let's bring down our bottom measure. It just touches the bottom there. And our top measure until it just touches the top here. And basically it says one volt peak to peak, which is exactly the signal that I'm putting in. So that looks pretty good. What's the, so let's put on uh, channel two. And we'll turn channel two on and we'll switch him to half a volt per centimeter. And I now need to trigger off channel two, not channel one. So this has got an independent trigger for channel B, if you wish. Oh, just to really confuse things. Let's move him down. And yeah, look, he, he's just the same as the, as the previous one. Absolutely perfect. Channel four is not looking quite so happy, is it? So let's trigger on channel four. Well, I'm saying that. Yeah, that's definitely a little bit under voltage on channel four. And I'm not entirely convinced with this. I think the switch has cleaned up now. Okay, so everything's triggered, everything's okay. Let's go back to channel one then. Trigger on channel one. Let's turn all these other things off. So I'm purely on channel one, it's measuring well. Let's increase the frequency then. There we go, 200 kilohertz, and we're still looking pretty good at our one volt peak to peak. Good from bigger steps. Two megahertz, and I'm still tracking nicely. All is well there. So I'm gonna wind this all the way up now until we get to that's 10 megahertz again. It looks fine. No, no problems there. Look at that. Nice. That's 20 megahertz. We're starting to see now a little bit of reduction in the amplitude. If I turn that to 0.2, hopefully we might see that better. And that means I need to adjust my cursors a little bit just so we can read that easy. Yeah, so 0.85 now. So we're definitely getting some attenuation at 20 megahertz. Let's move up to 30, further attenuation. And we're almost at the 3 dB point here at 30 megahertz. And of course, I shouldn't be there. There's 40. 
that's probably our minus 3 dB there. So I've only actually got a bandwidth of 40 megahertz instead of the intended 100. A very unfortunate problem. So that's 40 megahertz going into channel 2 now. Uh, I need to be on 0.2. Let me move that around. So that's about the same. It's about the same. Looks like both channels have got a 40 megahertz. Let me pop that down to 30. Yeah, it's just increased to slightly 20. That's 10 megahertz. I mean, that's perfect. So 10 megahertz, we're fine. And we are gradually, so that's 20 megahertz. We're just losing a bit at 20 megahertz. And let's try this in channel three then. So uh, we'll turn channel three on. That would be a good starter. That doesn't help, does it? Look at that. Okay. So I have managed to find a few diagrams relating to this. Um, not a huge amount, unfortunately. I've got nine pages in total. So, okay, this is our first diagram, and I got this from radiomuseum.org. I got them all from radiomuseum.org. And unfortunately, the manual on there is pretty small, but at least it exists. And there are some user instructions as well. Uh, if you're not a member, you can only download three pages a day. But um, yeah, that's not necessarily a huge drawback. So on the left hand side, we've got our four channels coming in. And what we're expecting, this is board MOY01 just here. And what this essentially does is we can see we've got four inputs and over on this side we've got two outputs y and the complement of y and this line just here is in actual fact a delay line so between those two points what we've got is some sort of switching going on at the front end which is attenuation and choosing amplifiers and stuff like that and setting levels of amplification and also it will have some um, ACDC switching and uh, what else will it have there? There will be frequency compensation on that input stage and also probe compensation for times 10 probes. And so that will go into an amplifier. And then we're expecting that to turn into a differential pair. We know it turns into a differential pair because we have a differential output. We also know that there must be some sort of switching going on on this thing, like a multiplexer, because there are four inputs and there's only one differential, I'll have to just draw that as a differential pair like that. There's only one differential pair coming out of it. So that's kind of what we're expecting to see. We're expecting to see four almost identical um, attenuation and amplification sections. And each one of those attenuation and amplification sections will have its own frequency compensation. And it will also have input switching with its own frequency compensation as well. So frequency compensated per channel at the input, frequency compensated in the first amplifier per channel, and then we switch it all, and then we frequency compensate again in another amplifier, which is driving our delay line. So that's the first point at which all of our signals come together through a common amplifier. We do not have to look at anything before that point because our problem is common to all four channels. So we need to look at the common frequency compensation sections and they're from that point forward. So we definitely need to look at this amplifier that's driving the delay line. And we also need then to look then at this next amplifier in MOY04 board, which is a small board and just one job. And um, it outputs the Y1 and Y2 plate signals. So it takes our differential pair, amplifies them up and sends them over here to this board, um, which is labeled MOZ01. And its job is basically to uh, drive the plates. There's a, another board down here, which is gonna drive the other pair of plates. But essentially we take our differential signals and we use them to drive our Y plates in here. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. So because our problem is across all of our channels, we know it must be in the common parts of the circuitry. So it's just starting to look at the individual circuit diagrams in a little bit more detail. I'm gonna talk about a couple of things on here, but I don't wanna spend very long. And that's because this here is all of channel one, and that's a input attenuation switching, attenuation, 
and stuff like that. And this one is uh, channel twos, switching and attenuation. And there'll be a similar diagram for channel three and channel four. The only thing that will be different is really this section here where we've got more range switching on channel one and channel two. So um, what have we actually got going on here? Well, we've got our input switching and we've got a little bit of frequency compensation, which is more like probe compensation going on just here. And depending upon what voltage range we're doing, we've got different compensation networks for each one of those up at the front here. We've then got some uh, amplification and then we go into our next set of range switches. So that's all fairly straightforward. What happens next though is very interesting because we, we become differential. We, we take our single ended signal and we convert it into a differential signal, or we start to convert it into a differential signal with balance. Uh, and that's really useful to us because it enables us to reason something. If our signals are differential all the way through, then it's probably not an active component that's causing our problem. Why do I say that? Well, because everything has to be in balance. So if, for example, oh yeah, I see two, Q3 on here, these are in an integrated circuit, load of transistors in one package. If, if that one goes faulty, then our signal isn't just going to be degraded in terms of frequency, it's also going to have distortion because the differential pair will be out of balance. So we're going to see much more dramatic effects from a faulty active component along this chain than we are if it's actually a common part. And it has to be a common part. So like this, for example, in the middle. This is actually a frequency compensator just here. So it's got a bunch of adjustments, uh, adjustable caps and some switching going on to switch in different range types of frequency compensation and some some uh, balance adjustments and things like that. So um, yeah, hmm. so that's quite interesting. We, we've potentially begun to realize that our problem must relate to some of these common sections in our amplifiers and, and pretty much all we're going to see is amplifiers going forward. Okay and here is channel 3 and channel 4 so this is still uh, MOY01 diagram and uh, hopefully you can kind of sort of see that it contains two identical sections again and that they're incredibly similar to channel 1 and channel 2. The only difference being all of this is like the first section of channel 1 and then the operation amplifier section is missing. And then we just get the same output stage that we saw on channel one. So it's just missing a little bit in the middle. That little bit in the middle relates to the additional range switching. So this only has two ranges, which are selected just here. Um, the other one had three ranges it selected there, and then it multiplied them by another three ranges further on to give nine. Okay, and yet more board MOY01 circuitry. So this is back to channel one and channel two. So again, not surprisingly, two completely identical parts. And they're basically just, we've just got more differential amplification and stuff like that. Overall, yeah, um, there's just a few frequency compensation sections in here, which again, only apply if it were a problem with a single channel or the problem was different across all channels that isn't the case so we can safely ignore these for the time being so this should be the first diagram that's of real interest to us and that's because this is the channel switching section so down the left hand side here we've got a massive section in which comes um, at the top we've got all the y channels so these are channel one, channel two, channel three, channel four. And these, of course, are all differential pairs coming into here. And then we've got a whole load of trigger information coming in and trigger B1, B2, B3, and so on. And same for the A trigger, because don't forget, there are two trigger circuits in this. So again, we can see the similarity between two sections in this diagram. Now, all this stuff here is all logic and switches. And um, ultimately, it's choosing which of these channels and which of these signals gets through to its next stage. In this case, um, at the top, we're switching between channel one, channel two, channel three, and channel four. So if we follow Y1 through, we go through this diode, and that diode is acting as a switch. Um, and I'll cover that in another video, maybe. Comes down here through this resistor, 
and into the front end of this differential amplifier just here. If we look at its differential, other half of its differential pair, it comes down this line, through this resistor, and into the into the, the mirror part of this circuit. So we can see just here we have our high frequency compensation section nicely labeled for us just to make life easy and this is our first common high frequency compensation so whatever we do with those compensation controls is going to affect all four channels simultaneously so this has to be our first kind of target if you like so on there we can see that we have just got not a lot of uh, compensation most of it's fixed and there is one capacitor trimmer in the center so that will be choosing the point let's say for example we have a let's draw a nasty diagram uh, a frequency dependent signal and uh, somewhere it starts drifting off and we want to boost that signal so that it comes back to kind of level or maybe we want it to be a bit higher than level because we don't know what's in the next amplifier stage of course um, that capacitor will be choosing at what point we start operating it won't be a huge range so it's 2.5 to 6 picofarads so it's not a massive range and then this resistor above it so resistor 19a is a trimmer and that's basically saying how much of that frequency compensation is being applied so it will move this this line up and down differently so the capacitor sets the uh, the cutoff frequency and the resistor um, alters the amount of compensation being applied so this is probably the circuit that uh, excites me most because uh, this is uh, MOY04 and it's called YN stuff which um, if we translate that roughly will mean the sort of final stage for the Y signals. We've got some stuff coming into it like trace separations and reference lines and beam finders and stuff like that just to complicate it a little bit but the core of it is a differential amplifier just in there. And we've got kind of our delay line coming in at one end, our differential coming out the delay line at one end, and we're amplifying it up to 25 volts uh, at the other end. Now, why do I think that this is the first place that I need to look? Well, because we've got this very big frequency compensation section in the middle, and it's the end of our circuit, which is always a good place to start. Um, but if we look at this frequency compensation, it starts off and we've got a 1000 microfarad electrolytic capacitor sitting in there. It's a 6.3 volt one, so it hasn't got a lot of headroom. So if we think about this block just here, we can see we've got lots of different values of capacitor, 1000 microfarad electrolytic, a 5 to 30 picofarad, which is similar to what we saw earlier, where essentially I said, the trimmer capacitor is setting the frequency upon which this control will, will act. So this is a high frequency section, five picofarad through to 30 picofarad. So it's gonna be set at something like 10 and will act at about 80 megahertz or maybe a bit less, 75, something like that. The trimmer will set the frequency we're acting at. And this section over here with its 47 picofarad capacitor will be the sort of midpoint frequency, let's say 50 to 80 megahertz. Now there'll be overlap of course, because each one of these will affect the frequency higher than its adjustment point. So this one will adjust all three, this one will adjust the mid frequency and the high frequency, and this one will adjust hopefully just the high frequency. So the order of adjustment is fairly clear. We do the low frequency, then the mid frequency, then the high frequency, and then we come back over it all and double check that we haven't done anything stupid. Why do I want to replace this capacitor straight away without even thinking about it? because I can't trust it. 1000 microfarad, 6.3 volt, you know, 50 year old capacitor. Can I trust it? No, I cannot. If I don't replace that, I won't be able to have confidence in anything else I do in this circuit. So I'm just going to replace it. It's as simple as that. I really hope it's easy to get out. And uh, having replaced that, it will be a different value to the one that was in there before. Even if the old one was good, it will be a different value. And then I'll have to adjust all of this section to get it right. So let's first of all go and do that, I guess. So first up, I'm sorry if the quality of this image isn't too good. I'm using my overhead camera and I really need to get a higher quality camera for that uh, view. But anyway, here is the inside of the scope and there are literally just three screws on either side you take off and the top and the bottom both come away. 
So um, let's have a quick look at a few important things. Here is channel one, channel two, and this one here being channel three and channel four. And each one has punched holes in this screening with all the various adjustments on for those specific channels. So that's really, really nice. That means we can do any per channel adjustment that is required relatively easily. So as we expected, we have the four channels coming down all independent. And over here, we've got our Y connections for the end of each channel. And they are disappearing off through a big long connector just here onto a board which I can't get access to, but it's down here basically. And um, so hopefully the fault isn't on that board because uh, that would be very awkward. So the four channels go down to the next board, which is the switching board. And then they come back just here in this corner and go into this loop. And this loop here is the delay line. And that delay line just has two outputs, one here and one here. And this is the board that we were interested in, MOY04, which contains our three adjustment points, well, four if you include the variable capacitor, and uh, that, that 1000 microfarad capacitor that I'm wanting to replace. In fact, it's about here on the board. And uh, fortunately, I only need to undo this this one screw just here, and that board will pop out. It kind of slides out from the other side. And unfortunately, I can't lift it out far because there's a lot of wires on there that are a bit short and they're all going to pull off if I'm not careful. So I'm probing a 90 megahertz signal on the end of the delay line at the moment in an effort to just see whether the frequency dependency is before or after that delay line. So is it on that board MOY04 or before it? So I switch down to, uh, you know, only about 50, 49, 30 megahertz now, and no frequency dependency is really being visible on that delay line. There is some, but it's nothing like what we're seeing on the scope as a whole. So that does indeed lead me to believe it's on board MOY04. And I just need that. Just need that removing as well. It's just holding that clip in place. And now, fingers crossed, I should be able to lift this board out. Take a little look at it. Uh, I can do so to a degree. So I'm going to connect up one of my scope probes to the output from this board. In fact, I'm going to join it up to point ST10 which is the output on one side of it. Uh, and then I'm going to put various frequencies through it. And uh, hopefully we will see the amplitude dropping off as that frequency increases and, and showing the problem that we're facing. And that will prove the problems on this board. If it isn't on this board, it's got to be on the next board, which is actually the amplifier for the plates. OK, so I'm starting off with about nine points, nearly 10 volts on the output at about nine megahertz. I'm just going to crank this up slowly. So here we go. An extra 10 megahertz on there, 20 megahertz or so. And we can see that that voltage is just beginning to drop off nine point eight point something now. And so it is definitely acting in a frequency. It's 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 trailing off as I increase that frequency in a way that is similar to we to what we saw on our front panel. So yeah, I am convinced that our problem is on this board MOY04. Okay, so I'm going to take a look at this section here on the board and uh, I'm going to start off by just replacing this 1000 microfarad capacitor just as I described a moment ago. So uh, we're sticking with the plan. So let's have a little look. And here is the capacity in question. And someone has already replaced that, but it could have been 20 years ago for all I know. And uh, so I'm still going to replace it. The other thing that I've done is I've had a look at the trimmers that are nearby it. And I can see that someone has already had a go and turned them all completely to one side. So no wonder the frequency response is so bad. Anyway, um, I'll replace that capacitor and uh, it's be a bit awkward because I can't really get underneath, but I can get access sufficiently. And uh, yeah, so let's get the iron, get that off, and then I can adjust all those trimmers. 
Okay, so the cap's not coming out too badly, just a bit of wiggling required, just that with a normal iron, and uh, just using some wick to uh, clean out the holes really for the next one. Unfortunately, they're not cleaning out too easily, so uh, I'm having to add a little bit of solder to uh, help it suck out a bit better, which is a bit of an old trick. Just uh, add a bit of solder, then re-wick, and hopefully the holes will clear. Otherwise, I have to get another suction gun out. I'm putting in a 1000 microfarad 16 volt, um, much higher quality capacitor than was there already. Just having a bit of difficulty getting the holes because access is limited. But we'll get this soldered up and then we'll uh, get these trimmers adjusted and hopefully everything will work out okay. And uh, yeah, I'm using leaded solder for this because I'm using the same type of solder as already exists on the board. I like to try and always do that if I can. So finally it flows. Making sure we get all the way through the through hole plated board. Okay, let's get that trimmed and uh, get on with the next stage. So here are the three, four trimmer holes. So uh, I'm actually going to cut away to a simulation now and just show you how they operate. So I thought it might be interesting to just see this in simulation, just how these resistors and capacitors work together to form this kind of variable filter. So I've got an input signal just here, which ranges between one megahertz and 100 megahertz. And then I've got three sets of resistors and capacitors, just like in the oscilloscope circuit diagram. Now I've got a hundred microfarads instead of a thousand, because, well, you know, um, it's just easier to do the simulation like that. I've got a 47 picofarad, which I think is what we've got in the diagram. And I've got a five picofarad, which is the very low one. So in theory, this five picofarad should be the very high frequency response. This should be the medium frequency, and this should be the general frequency response. I've got a 50 ohm here just to give it some output impedance and uh, yeah we're going to just measure the output and see what it looks like and this is what it looks like above in the diagram so we can see that we've actually got this kind of drop off it goes in kind of zones a little bit but generally speaking it's falling all the way now these three resistors i have actually made variable and on the right hand side are the slides so r1 is set to 5k at the moment and R1 is connected to this general frequency, the, the low frequency component. And if I modify it, we can see that actually the shape of the signal doesn't really change. What happens is the whole thing moves around. So this is kind of setting the, the level of the whole AC signal. Why is that useful? Well, this is just a passive circuit that I've got demonstrated here. But of course, ours is part of an active circuit and there will be a DC kind of level as well. So this will actually be capable probably of amplifying it as well as cutting the, the signal. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, the, uh, that's our low frequency end. So as you can see, we can just move stuff around quite freely and it affects everything after a very, very low number of Hertz. Now, the next one is 47 picofarad. And if I change the resistor attached to that, you can see that we can actually flatten a large proportion of the signal and it's not quite flat but it's near enough uh, for the for the sake of this demonstration and uh, we're still trading off at the right hand side however so let's bring that back down again so that's pretty pretty nasty let's pick up the right hand one and increase that and we can see that actually the right hand one with the low capacitor is only affecting the right hand side of this starting at about 20 megahertz or so so there we go now we're beginning to flatten off our frequency now of course this is a very simplified demonstration but hopefully it illustrates the point of these three frequency bands let's pull down the middle one and you can see that it affects everything after that mid sort of frequency point. Whereas the end one only affects the end of the frequency point. So using these three in a sensible configuration, we can hopefully flatten our frequency off. 
Now ideally we'd do something similar to this diagram where we actually use a tracking generator and generate a swept signal from 1 to 100 megahertz and we would then just adjust all of these trimmers while we look at the line flatten up on a, on a screen. However most people don't have that so I'm going to kind of do this with an oscilloscope and uh, I'll just choose spot frequencies and, uh, and adjust everything in multiple passes until everything flattens out. I'll actually use the oscilloscope on the test as the output just to actually view the waveform on it. Let's see how it goes. So this is quite a long job. What I'm doing is basically adjusting all these trimmers so that I can actually persuade each frequency band and I'm using kind of like, you know, five megahertz, 20 megahertz and 100 megahertz and stepping between those different frequency bands and um, just making sure that each control is capable of moving stuff around then I can actually start properly trying to level things out. But uh, And when I get there, instead of just using my external scope like this, I will switch around and I will use the uh, the measurement system on the front of the scope that I'm actually repairing to, to make sure that everything is flat. But it's a long job and uh, using ceramic trimmers because I'm touching a capacitive element here as well. and. Uh, yeah, just a, a case of persevering, really, and uh, trying to make sure that it looks pretty flat on the Rigel, and then uh, then I can just move on. There's no point in me flattening it totally on the Rigel because the next stage amplifier in the actual Grundig might well have its own frequency response, and I need to uh, kind of zero that out as well. Well, that took about 10 minutes, so let's see the results. I'm 500 millivolts peak to peak input and I'm just trimming up the cursors so we can see what's going on better and uh, 498 on the cursors and currently set at 10 megahertz on the signal generator I'm going to turn it down so yeah we can see that's just fine um, I think the low end is working absolutely fine let's turn it back up so 8, 9, 10 and 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 90 and there's a hundred and a hundred megahertz just the very slightest roll off barely a db i think certainly not three db that is for sure so it's looking really good and it's 120 megahertz now by the time we run into any serious reduction and again i think that's probably about three db maybe a little bit less but yeah working really nicely so just doing a quick test on channel b and when you see the uh mucky switch unfortunately is having a little bit of an effect there but i think we're there just adjust that down there we go and uh, we can see that channel b is also performing perfectly well i'm not going to go through the other channels in the video i think i'm about done for this and i'm also not going to go on and replace the capacitors and clean the switches and things like that i've got the principal problem solved that i set out to solve at the start of this video so I hope you enjoyed that. Not just power supply capacitors for a change, which is nice, but uh, a slightly different problem. In this case, actually caused by a previous repairer, not really finishing the job off, but uh, we've got it working again. And uh, I'll probably put this on eBay, I think now, and let some, um, some enthusiast pick up a scope for a good price and do their own work on the capacitors. They can put what value capacitors they want in then cheap ones or expensive ones, whatever they think is appropriate, and uh, clean up the switches themselves, and uh, this will be a good scope for them. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to uh, subscribe and like, and of course leave comments down below, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.